Hello. Uh, hello and welcome to the Radically Rural Arts Track Session 2. My name's Craig Stockwell. I'm a local artist and a uh, participant in many community uh, ventures involving the arts, including Arts Alive. And I want to acknowledge Arts Alive and Jessica Gelter, who uh, would normally be up here today speaking to you, but uh, we're filling in for her as she's protecting herself. <laughs> and um, thanks to our sponsor, the Putnam Foundation, and partners Hannah Grimes Center and the Keene Sentinel, and of course to our hosts here at the Colonial Theatre. And a special shout out to Alex in the back, who's helping with the sound. And um, Nina, who's helping with the, uh, the microphones and the, and the Zoom talk. Um, just a moment for logistics. Uh, for those in the room, the bathrooms are out through the doors at the back of the theater, to your right or left. Exits are all marked in case of emergency. You can head out the way we came in or through the side doors. And uh, for those of you online, hello. You've probably noticed by now that you can't see one another, but you can have a presence in the chat. Go ahead and pop a hello or an emoji into the chat to say hello. Folks here in the room can also participate in the chat. If you log into Radically Rural with the links that were emailed to you and click on our session, you can have chat with the participants that aren't here. If you do that, please make sure to mute your sound. I don't want to hear my voice here and there. Of course, that reminds me, cell phones, turn them to silence if you would. We are thrilled to have the vivacious energy of Dr. Jenna Stiles Lias of Americans for the Arts here today, and Eliza Tudor of the Nevada County Arts Council, and Selby Bartlett of the Chatham Arts Council up on the screen behind us, so soon to come on the screen. She, she'll be joining us remotely. Too often, there she is, hello. Too often in the arts and beyond, the power is held by a select few. So what happens when voices at the table lack diversity, when wielding that power, when creating systems, and when doling out resources so communities can thrive? This session explores a radical awakening, or maybe an obvious and overdue awakening. Art and creativity are at the core of how we express and record our humanity, how we seek out and share that which is beautiful. Since prehistoric times, and our culture is the collection of these expressions of our identity, our country, filled with immigrants from many lands, is rich with complex intersections of culture and identity. And yet, each of us lives and works on lands that have been, have been and still are the traditional homes of indigenous peoples. Keene, New Hampshire is unceded land, stolen almost 300 years ago from its traditional Abenaki stewards. The Abenaki called this place Endakina, but today it is known as Keene, named for British aristocrat Benjamin Keene, who never set foot in this place. So many stories of Amnaki culture and community have been erased. Our country's social, governmental, and economic roots are based in colonialism, racism, and indignity of dehumanizing and taking from black people, indigenous people, and people of color of erasing their cultures across the last 400 years. In allowing gatekeepers to exclude whole cultural communities from accessing resources, we have held our country back for generations. Most importantly, we have been held back from healing. But also, we have denied our country its true, complex, and multifaceted cultural identity. We have denied our planet deep generational knowledge and stewardship of the land, and we have denied each other the innovations that diverse cultural practices can foster. 
And just a quick note, I, I, I teach art. I teach painting, drawing in, in several different master's programs. And I would say the most fundamental change in the last 20, 30 years is, are these very recognitions and how it has changed the, uh, who we are and what we can do as artists. With the, exist with the existential challenges we are facing today, what we are building in our radically rural communities cannot afford to erase the history and legacies established by our ancestors. The story is already being written, the good and bad. Understanding the story will help us make a better world. I am welcoming you to Radically Rural's second arts and culture session by offering some truths about where we are and who we are so we can use this truth to build towards a brighter future. Thank you. And now I will pass it on to Dr. Jenna Stiles Lias. Wow, thank you, Craig. Oh, go ahead, you know, we love a good applause. Um, I hope y'all are ready to have some fun. Uh, this work, yes, I see. This work is so interesting. But before I do that, I wanna make sure I get to. My name is Dr. Jenna Stiles Lias. My pronouns are she, her, please. I want to lift up into the space in right following right uh, Craig's lead, the DMV area, so DC, Maryland, Virginia, the Piscataway and the Susquehannock people um, and the lands we uh, reside on there. I just wanted to lift that up in the moment um, before I introduced or before I let my cohort of partners introduce themselves. Um, Excited to be here. Thank you to the interpreters. Thank you, Jess, and thank you, Craig, for such a wonderful opening. Hello, Jenna, and hello, everybody in the room. Hello, everyone on Zoom, and hello, Selby. <laughs> um, we're going to be sharing a mic unless there is another one. Um, one of them had run out of battery. Um, I'm Eliza Tudor, Executive Director of Nevada County Arts Council, and I serve the Board of Directors for Californians for the Arts. That's the state advocacy organization over on the West Coast. So I think we, I think myself and my colleague Don Harris, former chair of California Arts Council, have flown the furthest today. Anyway, it's delightful to be here. And when I'm at home in Nevada County on the uh, Sierra Nevada, I'm residing on the ancestral homelands of the Nisanan tribe and the Washoe tribe, and that is part of my daily consciousness um, as I go about my work. Can we, can we get si Selby? Selby, do you want to introduce Hello. Yourself? Hello, thank you. My name is Selby Bartlett. I'm the managing director of the Chatham Arts Council in Chatham County, North Carolina which resides on the unceded lands of the Tuscarora. Uh, I am a female with shoulder length, salt and pepper hair, curly hair. Um, at least I like to call it salt and pepper. It's much more salt these days. Um, I'm wearing a black top uh, with a multicolored jumpsuit and glasses, and I'm sitting in front of a white background. Thank you, Selby, for that audio description. That is awesome. Um, I'm not sure if we can continue that, but I want to. Can I just do that really quick? Yes, wonderful. I'm a, uh, I'm a black woman with brownish lipstick, big hoop earrings, and hair that looks locked, uh, probably just below, almost waist length, sitting down. Um, I am a, a white person with fair hair, with rather a lot of um, salt in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Means I'm growing rapidly gray underneath it all. Um, and I'm sitting here in navy blue and black boots with a very pale face that needs more sun. And we are here to talk about a few things. I'm gonna hopefully next slide, Alex, if I can. Awesome. So that was the name of our project, right? This is the session that you're in. If you do not know this session or you are here by mistake, please stay. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. 
Um, these are just some considerations for thoughtful space as we share this, this time together, um, knowing that time is a gift, so we'll be cognizant of it. Uh, thank you for your presence. Did you get the, did you get the joke? Gift, time, presence. Thank you. Okay, okay. We, well, we, it's starting up slow. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Uh, embrace the chat. My folks who are online joining us, please comment. Raise your hand. Give an emoji in the chat. I'd love to hear and see your participation as best I can. This is a process over the next 90 minutes or so. We're going to get into it. And as long as we get into it, then it's a success. We don't have to have the answers at the end of the day. Because perfection is not real. You'll hear me say that probably about 50, 50 11 times. Uh, perfection is not real, and we're a team in this together. Here's what we're doing. We're doing the grounding and introductions now, but we're going to get into what is arts and economic prosperity study. Um, my title is the Director of Arts and Economic Prosperity Study 6, Community Engagement and Equity. It's a really long title. Um, so we'll talk about what does that all mean. Uh, when we get there. Uh, centering equity, uh, the learning process, and what does the future hold? And hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. But what I want you all to take away, by the end of this session, I'd love for you all to understand that process over perfection is critical. Critical community engagement involves building lasting relationships. And lastly, lean into discomfort and just show up. Just show up. All right, now we gotta have some fun. Here's the deal. Uh, I know y'all must, this is the end of the day. I would love us to play a game called Stand If. Now, if you don't feel comfortable or unable to stand, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to nod your head. If you're in the chat, send me a reaction. If you're in real life, you can raise your eyebrows. Do what you need to do um, to just show your agreement uh, to, this, to this game. So I'm gonna say something and you stand or react to it. Um, stand if, or react, you have recently been to an event. Can I see if you've recently been to an event? It should be almost everybody because here we are. We are at an event, y'all. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, before I have y'all get up and down because you, you might be tired, let me say, um, if you spent money, stay standing. If you spent money at this event, stay standing. That could be on food, if you bought some food, okay? When I say spending money, I mean, did you maybe have to pay for parking? Did you have some childcare, perhaps? Maybe you had to get a new outfit, you get your hair did, right? You gotta get your hair done, I know I did, y'all. Uh, anybody do any of those? Okay, so the whole room is standing. Okay, great. That's what arts and economic prosperity is all about. You all can be seated. That's what this study is all about, right? In 2017, we learned that on average, Americans spend about $30.47 per event, and that doesn't include the admission of the event. So that's the spending that we're looking at. And then 69% of um, folks who go to the area for an event and travel to come just for that event. And they're good spenders. Right? They're the people who go, oh, I'm going to clean and I'm going to go to this Radley World um, Summit. Cool, I'm also going to spend money at this local grocery store, and I'm going to see if there's some other events. My daughter is going to the Children's Museum. She's here with us. So there's, there's spenders who spend and stay and come for events only. 69% is what we found. So what does that mean? That means arts means business. Arts means jobs. Arts means money spent in the sector. And that's what this study is unpacking. We all know, I'm an artist at heart, we all know art for art's sake is good. We don't have to justify art our art for money, right? But some folks do need that. When we talk about politicians and some change makers, those are critical pieces of data and results that go miles beyond just the experience uh, in certain sectors. So that's what this is about. 25 years we've been doing the Arts and Economic Prosperity Study. This is the number six, um, and it's been a critical tool for advocacy in communities. There's two key components. There is an audience intercept survey. So for example, if we were doing it right now, I'd be like saying, hey y'all, can you please fill out this survey? It's 13 questions, and you all will be doing your survey at some point. And then we send it back to Americans for the Arts. So there's the audience part. They talk about how much they've spent. I don't wanna get in your business. 
but I know y'all spent some money, y'all were all standing up. Uh, then there's the second part, that's the organizational survey, where we talk about budgets for them. We talk about what's your full-time equivalency, how many jobs are you providing, what are your spending? So we see how the money goes in circles inside the community and when it finally leaves. So that's kind of the root of the study when we get really super nerdied down into it. I just made up a word, nerdied, so I hope you guys caught that. Uh, customized reports. At the end of this year-long process, approximately two years, but year-long process, we are able to give communities their own customized report of their economic impact in their region and then nationally um, so that they can see how they stack up against other communities and within their own industry by industry. So here's a little timeline of where we are. There's a little finger that's pointed to you are here. Really, we're just in a space of collecting surveys. In a couple of months, the organizations will have about six months to finish their survey process. By April 2023, that's all the way at the end, or no, I'm sorry, April 2023 is uh, number five, if you see above, um, where we say data's done, let's actually crunch the numbers and start to get out those customized reports. So we're really halfway through the process, but it is a long process. What does it mean to the communities that we serve? Well, we're nothing without our partners. We're in 395 communities all across the country in all 50 states, including DC. So this is a massive project, and there would be no project if it weren't for the critical partners. We call them our local or statewide partners who help support the efforts of this whole audience intercept survey process, so it's pretty critical. We started with just 33 communities, and you just heard what I said, 395, y'all. This is growing, and it's going to keep getting bigger because it's getting results for communities. The goal here is to answer the question, what happens if we change the resources? What happens if we funnel money from somewhere? I'm not going to name the place. Y'all can imagine. You can all fill your ideas with where we funnel it from, but into arts and culture. What does that look like? Can you imagine it? Um, so I want to talk, do I get to talk some more? I get to talk some more. Let me just go through my notes. I'm just going to keep it real and sing a song while we just wait for me to turn the page. When we talk about this study, we found that 72% of Americans believe that arts can unite us, regardless of race, age, ethnicity. And so what does it mean to center on equity? Let me tell y'all something. I'm going to be real. I'm going to talk from the heart. I'm going to be real. That's my, that's my personhood coming out, but you will understand. This process has been a long one. We have shifted to center on equity. What does that mean? We're being transparent in our process. Everything's available online if you'd like to look. We work with our partners intensely. Uh, we make sure that it's clear where we're standing, and I'll talk more about what that transparency is. It means like being okay with airing things that are maybe not so cute. Um, we talk about community engagement. What does that mean? Boots on the ground, building partnerships with our partners and helping them to build partners inside their communities, beyond their grantees, the folks that are on their mailing list, but into other spaces and places. And what I wanna say about that is that that is taken through partnership. Partnership, 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 and the mutual support of our partners and Americans for the Arts. So that's kind of been critical. And finally, most importantly, where are we going, right? We're going into BIPOC, which is black indigenous people of color, or we sometimes say Alana, which is African, Latinx or Latino, your preference, Asian, um, African, and Native American spaces to ensure that these organizations are counted. Because remember I said about that transparency part, I'm a laid on a table. Over almost 30 years now, actually, because by the end of it, it'll be 30 years now. We have encouraged organizations who partner with us, your local arts agencies, perhaps, who partnered with us to go to their big economic driving organizations. You can probably name some of them. When you think about biggest 
arts and culture economic driving organizations. Anybody have an idea you want to scream out? I'm, I'm from the church, y'all. I like to talk back when we talk back to each other. Anybody know? They're big, they're big, they're big culture hubs, yes. I'm talking about those performance spaces. I'm talking about where would you go that the ticket price is generally very high and the, um, the people who are in the audience tend to look the same, tend to spend about the same. The Met. The Met, yes, the Met Opera House, yep, you got Carnegie Hall, yep, you got those big uh, opera houses, those big performance spaces, those big spaces, and what we have done in the past is say, go, make sure you survey those, make sure you survey those organizations, the end, period. What we have forgotten about and underrepresented and marginalized is those BIPOC and Alana organizations, or perhaps those smaller organizations that don't have those big economic drivers like those other organizations that you all just named. So what are we doing? In 2020, we were gifted an opportunity. I shouldn't say gifted, but we had an opportunity with the COVID pause to stop, break apart our process, our methodology, take a look at our practices, and reframe what we're doing going forward. They hired me. They made this role for me. I'm only seven months in at Americans for the Arts. They made this role for me. They made this role for them, for us, to come into the space a different way, to include equity in the conversation at every stage of the process, not just at the end after the results happen, but at every stage. Intentionally collecting the data and driving partnerships to the heart of this conversation. And so without partnerships, we would have nothing. So I want to talk to one of our partners, and I want to get a perspective of what you find, Eliza, in this process as game-changing or your experience with the process thus far. Thanks so much, Jenna. Well, I'm going to first of all paint a, just a tiny picture of the community that I come from, because even though I sound like I'm English, I've lived for a long time and had all my children in the, um, on the, the western slope of the Sierra. So in our county, which spans the rolling foothills of what's called California's gold country, we try not to use that phrase so much anymore. We don't want to place our identity around it. All the way up to the high Sierra, so that's 7,500 feet. So for me to go from one end of the county to another on my daily, you know, during my daily work, at least once a week, I have to cross a massive pass that you've probably heard of called the Donner Pass, the ill-fated Donner Party that passed over from west to east. It was their sort of last thing before they got to California in the west. So 70% of the county is wilderness. It's national and state forests. You cross rivers that you don't know are going to be flooded. There are, it's one of the areas in the country that's most at risk of catastrophic fire. Increasingly, during the summer months, our air is uh, categorized as hazardous. So all this affects the way, um, due, to, due, to, due to the fire, so all this affects the way that we approach the surveying of our audiences and our relationship with our arts organizations, which are scattered across three incorporated communities. The whole population is a about 100,000, we're just on the edge now. We're quite glad we were just under when we applied to do the survey, because it, it meant a slightly less financial investment. Thank you very much, Americans, for the R. <laughs> so it's extreme, it's not the same. So serving a rural community and being in constant planning and evaluation mode, um, which is so important, as we all know, in, in um, spurring growth and equity is a very, very different picture and provides a different outlook in rural California. So we first did, we first partnered with Americans for the Arts in 2018, completed our survey in 2019, and were stunned by the results. At the outset, Americans for the Arts, like Jenna said, um, perhaps to provide encouragement to us, said, just go to your, you know, your main obvious um, cultural institutions and, and anchor institutions because they're the ones that are going to produce the data that's going to push your economic 
um, picture up and show up on your final report. But we had slightly different ideas, and Americans for the Arts did encourage us. We had slightly different idea. We thought, but we know there are informal collectives and collaboratives and creative businesses that are cropping up all over the county. We might not know who those people are, but we want to get to know them. We're going to use this survey as a way to get to know those small, tiny organizations that can't even be called institutions yet. And that's what we did. And I think that really helped us. It created a completely different, sort of more socially aware um, perspective on how we did our surveying. We, we, we hesitated about doing a survey so close um, uh, as 2022, we thought it's a little bit too soon after the pandemic. It's going to shine a light on the arts that might not necessarily be as formidable in terms of economic impact as it was just before. Um, but we were so excited by the work that Americans for the Arts was doing in terms of racial and cultural equity and social justice that we jumped on board because we thought, after all, this is something we already have a little bit of practice in. We did it, you know, just so, and now this is going to up the bar on our work together. So we're in the process of doing that now. I love that. And Eliza, it, this is the partnership we're talking about. When I had the conversation with Eliza and understanding, oh, you all already have done some of this work. like. That is encouraging, and that pushes us forward, too. Um, so I just appreciate all of the things that you, you said. I also want to turn it to Selby, if she can join us. Um, and Selby's going to talk about, too, her sort of experiencing with what it looked like to center equity in her organization. And I talked to Selby, and the first time I talked to her, I was like, oh, y'all are doing this work too. It's really aligning. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about um, sort of your community and how you have centered this work there. Thank you, Jenna. I appreciate it. So um, Chatham County, North Carolina, we, we are a small population, right around 78,000 um, people. And we are mostly rural, uh, 69 or excuse me, 66% of our county lives in a rural area. Um, and so we, we had our own unique challenges. And I'll specifically, I'll start with um, the pandemic. Um, as you mentioned, it kind of made a lot of us, maybe all of us stop and think and reassess. Um, so it took us from our artists and schools residency programming that we had to virtual online programming. I'm sure um, we are not alone in that. Many Many arts organizations um, found that vehicle um, helpful to be able to continue to bring the arts to people in their community. Um, we evolved our work uh, to answer those immediate needs in Chatham for our students and, and our schools. Um, but this type of learning, the remote learning, really spotlighted uh, a great inequity, um, probably the greatest inequity in our time and that is internet access um, and access to content and access to services um, and access to people and connections. And um, we talked, as I mentioned, we talked with principals, schools administrators, and those remote days that these kids had um, for many schools were poorly attended. Um, you guys may have seen this in your communities, but, um, it was really in part or in whole days. Um, they were missing students. They, they weren't able to make it to their classes for various reasons. Um, and some of that is access related. Um, some of that was working parents. Some of that was family struggles. Um, and so while our virtual Artists of the Month series um, and our interactive workshops served many of the children with great impact in our community, um, there were a lot of families still that were not able to access this work. And it took us to look at the data um, in our community to be able to um, take what we had heard um, from people through stories and examples, um, but then take that, that information and, and help us um, really look at what we were seeing. So, the themes that guided us, I don't know if you guys have the slides pulled up on the screen. I can't, I can't see them. Uh, one more, please. 
Yes. There we go. So the themes that guided us, um, changing lives. So how are we impacting those in our community, um, creating community and bringing people together and then contributing to the arts landscape. Um, so we're doing all of this with a focus on equity, access and diversity. Um, as I mentioned, many parts of our county were um, and are unserved or underserved. Um, many residents struggled with access to digital um, services and it underscored the need for high-speed internet connectivity. Um, the children that were impacted at this uh, were our most vulnerable in, in many different ways. Um, those who were economically vulnerable, uh, food insecure, and were part of families who spoke English as a second language. Um, so what we did is we looked at some of the US census data uh, that would help us understand this a little bit better. So across the US, US census data said that around 15% of the population were unserved or underserved when it came to broadband internet access. Uh, for Chatham, it was around 19%, closer to 20%. Um, so this, this just validated um, what we had been hearing. And so I would have expected it to be higher based on the experiences um, and, and who we were talking to. So there's just a couple of factors I want to make sure that we're all thinking of when we think about data. And that is, and, I, and I've heard Jenna say this before, but, you know, those things that um, aren't known to you um, or that you're not asking about, that they're not there. They don't show up in the data. Um, so, for example, what this doesn't tell us is how many of those households didn't have access to an additional computer. Could be that they had an internet access and their parent was using that to do their work remotely, but there wasn't another computer in the household to be able um, for that for that child to be able to go to school. Um, so, so the data can help guide us and inform us. Um, it isn't always the full picture, um, you know, and and I think the data that Americans for the Arts, we're really excited. This is our first time being able to join the study. Um, and so we're really excited about the data that this is going to bring to us and help inform our, some of our decisions within um, our community. But what it helps us is there's a story around it. It's not just the data, it's the story that goes with that data. And hopefully today we'll be able to talk more about that. Much. Oh, yes, I didn't get the mic the first time. I just said I love that, Selby. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, that conversation mixed with Eliza's conversation, mixed with, there are 395 communities, y'all. I've talked to at least 220 of those communities, those people who support or represent those communities. I was inundated with information and with learnings. And we had a lot of them, we had a lot of them. Um, so I wanna show the slide for our learnings. Uh, the first one was that perfection is not real. We had, we hit our head against the wall a few times already and continue to. And we're a national organization, right? We're Americans for the arts. We should know what we're doing. We have good ideas, but we don't always get it right. We don't. And we should fight against trying to be perfect all of the time. We're working it out, we're figuring it out, and we're gonna work together with the community to get there. So my second learning is one size fits all, doesn't fit all. And what you see on the screen is a QR code. You're welcome to use it. This is an engagement part of our day today. I think our wonderful tech team, Nina and Jessica, are going to perhaps drop a link into the chat for our folks who are joining us online. That is the US Census data. I talked, uh, Selby was talking about this, and we originally came out for this project when we started to talk about how we were gonna get BIPOC and Alana organizations to show up. We were like, uh, how do we do that? Data to data point, how does it work? Well, as a good researcher knows, you need a good sample to, in order to actually analyze things. So that's 200 surveys out of the 800 surveys. So that's 25%. So we first were like, all right, 25% of our audience intercept surveys across 395 communities are gonna come from BIPOC and Alana organizations events. Guess what, y'all? Some folks based on census data and based on eyeballs 
don't even have that level of population of BIPOC and a lot of people in their neighborhood. So that didn't work. That's not a one-size-fit-all situation. So we went here. We went to the census data, and I want you all to play with it yourselves, too. So you go to the website. Top left, you can enter your information. You can enter your zip code or your um, state or your community. Probably community-centered, because that'll be as most specific. And then scroll down to race. And what our researchers used is the white alone category, not including Hispanic and Latino. There's reasons behind that, as though we know that some Hispanic and Latino folks do identify as people of color, some do not. But in an effort to include as much as we can, and, as much, and not to exclude folks who do, we did the white alone category. So check out your numbers. Check out your numbers. Raise your hand if you have like 20% of your community is, is BIPOC and Alana or above. About 15. 10. No judgments. Yes, 10, 5, 5%. Okay, great. 2% under 5. We still learning about it? Awesome. Awesome. So that is the kind of detailed, intentional data collection we can now offer, right? So instead of doing a 25% flat rate all across the nation, we customized this to be not only achievable, but still push the envelope forward, because we're not escaping the fact that we still want these folks in our conversations, brought to the space, and brought into the community more fully. So we failed. But when we failed, we continued to fail forward. We failed because we thought we were going to do 25% and we didn't realize or maybe perhaps didn't consider that like, that's not the reality everywhere. We continue to fail. We continue to think about, okay, what, where does accessibility show up in this work? We have 23 different languages that we offer the survey in, but when we're going into the communities, are we considering who is trying to survey these audiences? What's the representation like for that? So we're still failing and learning and failing and learning and inter, 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 the word I'm looking for is inter, interative. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, experiences of change. And how do we do that? How do we test every single change and make it something successful? This is Eliza's. This, Talking to Eliza, this is the quote that made me feel very well grounded in this work. Um, the image above is a mural actually from an organization I worked for, uh, worked with in Baltimore, um, but it's a public art installation. And her comment here made me think of the landscape of these communities and how the smaller organizations show up in relation to the bigger organizations, show up in relation to BIPOC organizations and otherwise. It's a, it's a mosaic. It's a beautiful mosaic. And if you take away one of those little yellow pieces, it's not going to look the same. If you take away a bunch of those little pieces, it will even look even more different. We want all the pieces, all the shapes, all the sizes, all the colors to be represented in this study. So Eliza, I'd love for you to talk about your efforts in going into the community and finding these organizations and finding these peoples and having these conversations. Thank you. Well, I think. Um, there are a couple of things involved. By, by, first of all, there's geographic equity. So by extend, expanding beyond our, you know, recognizable townships, hopefully incorporated, um, we go out into places that we didn't know existed. And we meet people that we didn't know existed or, and we understand and we learn their stories. That in itself will bring surface greater diversity um, and greater need. Um, when I began with Nevada County Arts Council in 2016, my first priority was to um, gain the trust of our local tribe, the Nisanan. We're talking about a tribe that was um, affected by near genocide as a result of the gold rush, um, who um, at their height had close to 10,000 in number, and as a result of the gold rush, now have a hundred and, I think it's 42 members, and are perilously close to extinction. So we've 
um, uh, created programs connected with language recovery, for example, um, and applied for state funding for that, over time gaining their trust and being invited into events that we can then survey, and also supporting the tribe um, as an example and, and supporting smaller organizations do the surveying with them. So, um, as Jenna explained during the first part of our presentation, there are two elements to arts and economic prosperity. There's the audience surveying, and then there's the surveying of the organizations for their revenues. So when we survey large organizations, there's usually no issues at all. They come up with the numbers, it's easy, press the button, submit to Americans for the Arts, whatever. But with some of our smaller creative producers, it's frightening to be asked what your data is and means. So we will sit with them and we develop a, a, a team of volunteers, which is not easy, as we know, in rural communities. It takes time to go in and sit with them and, and look at 990s together and, um, and pull out um, just those areas of their revenue, their budgets, that speak to the creative production. We don't want to do any double accounting. Um, we, we're very conservative, but just having that human contact and sitting with an agency or with an individual running an extraordinary, budding, um, creative um, organization is, is critically helpful. I'd say we've had some really interesting adventures this summer. We, last week we surveyed, um, we went and surveyed audiences, um, or attendees, I should say, at a Latino family festival. We were advised, out of sensitivity and consideration for the population being served, not to be among our audience, but to stand behind a table separate from them and wait for those attendees to come to our table. We just knew it wasn't going to work. We just knew it wasn't going to work because part of the effectiveness of the AEP study is being with your, your people, your community members, so that they can get to know you, they can feel you, and there's a sense of place and space between you both. So, um, we thought of a way, a sneaky way around it. <laughs> a very dear friend of the organization happens to speak Spanish fluently and in fact speaks several other languages. And we brought this person with us and um, very um, gently um, um, ha had, had him walk around among the audience. He was completely at home. These were his people. They trusted him implicitly. And he sent, he sent our audiences to us, where we then gained um, their trust as well. Um, I could go on about the ways that we gain trust. Um, uh, for example, one of the first things we ever say when we're um, um, surveying our audiences, um, an individual audience members is, we're not going to take your personal details. No one will ever know your name. They won't have your address, they won't have any contact information, it's completely anonymous. We only want to know what you have spent. Um, we do take a zip code, because that's really helpful data for us and Americans for the Arts in analyzing the data and creating that story that we all want back. But um, we, the first message is, it, this is anonymous, don't be afraid. We might be speaking to undocumented people and so we want to put them uh, immediately at rest. We had the same thing last week. We went to um, a Mexican heritage festival and uh, the same thing occurred. It was very, very hard to get audience surveys um, unless we were able to walk among our audiences and have that human contact. So I'd say using uh, uh, making sure that your organization has proper representation as volunteers is absolutely critical. And we're all doing this work anyway, and there's a reason for it. It's because we want to build trust. Yeah, I, I love that. Thank you, Eliza. That trust building, that process of it all, that failing first when you couldn't come into the crowd, but then you got the uh, person of the community that you are interested in serving to actually do or interview the community they're a part of. Wow, that is a thought, right? That's such a good idea. Um, I love that so much. And I love that it's becoming now not just about this economic impact, but 
there's a whole new this time is a whole social impact element of it that I've heard some folks say, I'm going to start on the back side of the survey because that's where the social impact questions are to gain trust. And then we go to the dollars and cents because that can freak people out, especially if I'm paying $40 outside of my $80 ticket, that's a lot of money. Um, so just, just naming those things are part of building the relationships and building the trust amongst folks. There's another thing I wanted to mention. There are implicit impacts, like incredible impacts that come from placing oneself at service to populations that are out of one's comfort zone. And especially when you can't speak that language yourself. Um, at the Latino Family Festival last week, I had uh, members of the Latino community coming to us um, saying we, we simply, you know, essentially we, we, we didn't know you were here. Mm. We had no idea that you have resources that could serve our families. And that was incredible. I just thought, gosh, this is gold. Mm -hmm. I'm yes. so glad that we are here to serve. I love that. I love that as an outcome, right? We already talked about the economic impact, economic impact, economic impact, money, 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 right? But we don't talk about those relationships and those ideas of like, oh, this is a pathway to an event or an organization or becoming incorporated or becoming blah, 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 whatever your dream is when it comes in arts and culture. That's, this is a through line. This is a way to get access to that stuff. It's beyond, it's incredible. So I, I, Selby, I wanna bring Selby back because she has such, this is the story I heard from Selby and I was like, oh my gosh, y'all are again thinking outside of the box and being able to speak to community in a way that I think we all want to do. And I want to encourage everyone in the nation that's a part of the study, that hears about the study, to do this kind of intentional work. So I wanna make sure that Selby can come back. And Selby does have slides, so we, We'll go to sell these slides. Thank you. Okay. I can't see them on the screen. So, if, oh, there we go. Ooh, the text is cut off a little bit. Okay. So, uh, we started with doing good, then doing better and um, failing forward. So, as I mentioned, you know, we, we found that a, a lot of the children in our community were not being served through the interactive workshops and our virtual residency programs. And so, you know, with those guiding themes in mind that I talked about, we, we sat down, we brought a group of people together, um, school administrators, parents, teachers, um, some of our board members, and we said, okay, what can, what can we do? how can we reach these children during these extremely difficult times? And so um, we looked at trauma-informed education research around the importance of children making and seeing art together in person. Um, and we came up with the idea for a truck and trailer roving artist performance. And that's when the idea was born. And um, we started this back in 2020. Um, and well, actually 2021, um, so towards the end of 2020 is when the idea came about. And, and so that was like a period of time where we weren't servicing these children. And so, um, it took, it took us a minute to, to understand the impact, to come up with ideas on how we could address it, um, and then to put it together and, and get it out into the world. And, um, the way that we started it was we put some musicians, they, they played sitting on the back of a trailer you can see here on the left hand side um, and the dancers followed behind in the street and then we had a pickup truck behind them with Jeffrey the bubble guy um, creating huge soapy bubbles um, and he he brought up the rear of the parade but through this work we prioritized our our most vulnerable children and um, three of the four truck and trailers um, performances visited um, um, communities within our um, county that were not being serviced um, equally. And so I, I think Eliza talked about geographic equity and that's um, nice word to put a rent words to put around it. Um, we were trying to bring equity to those areas of our county. Um, and you know, then I would say um, 
what we found in those early days, if you want to flip the side for me, that would be fantastic. Um, in those early days in April of 2021, um, we learned that these children found joy and solace. Um, they found connection, healing, meaning, and wellness. Um, when that track and trailer of musicians and dancers kind of rolled through their neighborhood, um, what we didn't expect was that the grown-ups did too. Um, we learned that when you meet people, children and adults alike, where they are and going to them where they are, that there is a feeling of being seen. Um, if you could change the side, please. So this couple here to the left, um, they said to me as I'm, I'm walking along, um, thank you so much for coming here and bringing this to us. Um, we learned that when you show up through art where people need you most, that love and connection show up too. And we learned that these communities, this is the biggest one, um, their, their need for access to the arts was ongoing. It was not limited to times of remote learning. So um, there were a lot of, of falling forward, a lot of learning as, as we did this. It was very agile um, as we went from community to community throughout the year, um, finding the things that, that worked for each community. And, and each of them were different uh, and they had different needs. Um, on the right side of the screen, you're, you're, you're seeing uh, Jelly Sissico, he is a, a Senegalese um, drummer and chora player. Um, thanks to a vital grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, we were able to um, help continue the support of this program. And um, he was on the back of the truck and trailer um, and he was playing the drum and the chora along with uh, the Takiri folklore uh, Latino dancers, and they were dancing behind to the music. And it was just a really happy fusion of um, their common roots and their music coming together um, in, you know, both music and dance forms. Um, and it was just, it, it, that was very unintentional and in, in terms of them seeing those common roots between them, um, but it was a very beautiful thing. And when the sun had gone down, uh, and this joy-filled journey was, uh, was coming to a close. Some of the children were not quite ready for that to happen. And so they jumped on the trailer. You'd see them here um, with Jelly. And they started making music right alongside him. And, you know, when, when I say bringing the arts to these children, where they are is so important. Like one of these kids at the end, he said to Jelly, you know, can I take this stick? I've never played the drums before. And I would love to be able to play the drums like after you leave. And by making a makeshift, like he was talking about using a paint can. Um, and, you know, I think in that moment, at least I did, I realized that the impact we were having on these kids individually and as a collective. Um, and if you could go to the, the next slide, please. So in this makeshift um, parade of drummers and dancers and bubble guys, um, these kids and these families, they, they saw faces like theirs, black, brown, white. And so I think it's important to note that one of the things we were very intentional about was a, a focus on diversity um, and that our artists are re a representation of the people in our community and they are a model for these young people. And so that was very intentional, very purposeful, um, and important to the work that, that we are doing with the Arts Council. So I will turn it over, um, back over to, to Jenna. Um, you know, we have a little bit more from the future, but I'll let her speak to that now. Yeah, totally. Thank you, Selby. Um, the future is a wild place, y'all. Look, we don't know. Um, uh, I think that the future holds a lot of different things. Um, these stories impact the research team and all of the other communities in such a way that 
We're planning, the process continues. AEP five is not AEP six, right? We're in six now. And AEP seven, the next one up, is gonna be completely different than AEP six. There's learnings that we're still taking that, oh, we should have had that for AEP six. That's all right, we're gonna use it for AEP seven. Um, so these studies are going to continue every five years and, and we're gonna continue to invest in communities and hopefully an outcome would be that by AEP seven, the folks that we met during these pathway conversations are engaged in the community. They're a part of the, the ecology of the arts and culture fully in however they want to be. If they want to have one event a year, if they want to not have an event, whatever way they want to be, they're able to be there because they know it exists. They know that their person who's helping support these efforts are invested and really mean what they're going to say when it talks about when it comes to being a resource and being able to provide arts and cultures in a way that's unique. We're committed to supporting continued partnerships like this one, that, like these that we have on the one of the first slides there were pictures of all of our community partners or some of our community partners, continuing to support them and continuing to partner with them um, in unique and different ways. So beyond AEP6, we still want to have our partners as critical stakeholders, using T's term from the earlier session, critical stakeholders in our process, right? Um, and then lastly, uh, strong relationships moving forward. We have created a treasure trove, if I may, of resources that will help continue the process forward. So for instance, like how to engage with your community, how to make connections with BIPOC and Alana organizations, those resources and guides are based on research, based on um, practitioner knowledge, and based on these stories. And we share them with our 395 communities to help build out resources that go forward and beyond, build cohorts amongst folks, Everybody in AEP6, join the Slack channel. Let's continue to communicate and continue to build partnerships for further forward long-term relationships with not only our partners, but with other organizations. And that's AEP's future, though. That's arts and economic prosperity study future, or at least how we see it. But I'd love to hear um, some of maybe Selby start and then, Eli and then Eliza uh, about the way that they see the future. Sure. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, with our truck and trailer roving performance, I, I think um, some of the things that we found that we learned um, that we are using for the future are return, return, return again. So keep going back to the communities that we are in because we're building those relationships, those strong relationships with their communities. And as Eliza was mentioning, like we're bu building trust. Right. So by, by coming back and them seeing us over and over again, they, they begin to trust us and more and more they're engaging with us. Um, also, communicating early and often. So we found that, you know, we, we would put up signs for an event like a couple of weeks beforehand. And what we found was that we really needed two things. The, the flyers were great. Um, but we needed to put them up probably a month or so in advance um, for enough people to see them and, and really be able to kind of plan around it. But then also there are people in the community, in that neighborhood, who are advocates and they're trusted within that community. And so um, it was really important that we communicate with them early and, and they are behind us in this and helping support it and helping get the word out in that neighborhood. Um, this sounds, um, yeah, I, this one I have to fall on my sword for. Um, we, we had dual language flyers. Um, most of the communities that we went into, um, were, um, uh, Hispanic speaking neighborhoods uh, or Spanish speaking neighborhoods, excuse me. And so all of our materials, our flyers were dual language, but our banners are, um, our flags, um, the information that said who we were, all of that was not. And so we learned pretty quickly that we needed to make sure that all of those, um, all of our materials were in dual language. That wasn't just from a communication perspective, but also from a trust perspective that we're there supporting them um, in that. And then um, the last thing is really is mixing it up. So we're bringing in some new artists 
um, this go around um, that we're really excited about. And um, we're bringing in some Linera music um, along with uh, bluegrass and old time. So again, a, a really cool fusion of different types of music with um, Larry Baloran and Joe Troop. So we're pretty excited about that. And, and I think um, the AEP6, what, what that has brought to us, um, if I can just transition into that a bit, is that we've found um, coming into these communities because we are now trusted more with the, the work that we're doing there, um, that we're then welcomed to come in and do the surveying. So we just last week went to um, the Hispanic Heritage Fiesta in Siler City, which is the, the place that we keep bringing the, the truck and trailer artist residencies back into. And, and we were welcomed with open arms, please have a booth. Um, you know, we had a craft and, and they were really excited about the craft that we were bringing to the children there. And we, we had a really good number of folks filling out surveys and we just talked with them about, you know, worked with their kids on the craft, but then talked with them about the work that we're doing in their schools and in their neighborhoods. And then they were much more willing to fill out the survey. And so it's kind of like learning as we go, being the first time um, into the survey study, that we are, we're finding that um, the ways that we interact with these communities, the ways that we are um, integrating ourselves with them is, is bringing a newfound relationship that we didn't, we didn't have beforehand. So um, we're really excited about that. That's awesome, and I appreciate the, I'm excited, I didn't hear about this festival, so that is new. I'm like jazzed about the fact that they have been opened, it had open arms uh, for the community. I think that that's incredible, and that is, I hope, the reflection and the legacy of AEP6 into AEP7, so that is awesome. Eliza, what are your thoughts on the future? So again, thoughts on the future take me slightly back in that at the end of 2015, legislation was passed in California by the state saying, okay, California Arts Council, state agency for the arts, you are going to hereby go forth and create a California cultural district program. We followed this legislation, which had no money attached to it, applied through a uber competitive process to become um, a California cultural district in two parts of our county. We are now a county that has two of only four rural California cultural districts in the whole state of an inaugural cohort of only 14. Really competitive, no money attached, tons of evaluation, massive amounts of accountability. We thought, why wouldn't we want to engage in serious cultural planning? Simultaneously, Nevada County Arts Council is one of only 20% of county arts agencies that is entirely lacking in municipal or county government support. So for us, cultural planning felt really, really important. We needed to show our mettle, make sure we were in sort of pretty, pretty um, constant, sort of low burning um, cultural planning at any one stage. So we thought we'll start having done this exhaustive process of becoming California cultural districts. Um, we thought we'll create an inventory of everything we know and subsequently don't know about our community in terms of organizations. And it was that work which we had to produce for the state that led to us being even halfway ready to do the economic impact study with Americans for the Arts. So each time we took a step towards serious cultural planning in order to throw a light on the arts and the creative sector, we had to sort of, what was the expression, a marvelous expression, sort of falling forward or failing forward where we always felt like, oh my goodness, we're not doing quite as well as we could do because we don't have the money to support these massive Sub, you know, what turned out to be volunteer efforts towards something we just knew had to happen. We had to have the data married with the story in order to keep swimming upstream, if you like. I live in a region of, of incredible rivers um, that are very important within our community and we're constantly trying to protect those rivers so that 
salmon can swim upstream. And honestly, it feels like that half the time. So Americans for the Arts Economic um, Impact Study, AEP, is a means for us to just keep with the current and keep swimming upstream. Yes, Eliza, and I think you all are like a, a conduit of that. And we're learning from what you all are doing and building it into our process. And I hope that it's a mutual situation. So I'd love for us to have a pair and share moment. You know I'm a teacher, I'm an old school teacher. When we turn to our neighbor and pair and share, um, I'd love to kind of get us queued up for questions in that way so that we can have some dialogue with each other and kind of name um, perhaps the scorcher moment, the thing that's burning in your head that one of the three of us has said, hopefully it's something, um, that one of the three of us has said that you were changed by, you're inspired by, or you have more questions about. Um, so those are the three sort of questions sort of rooted in this parent share. So if you could turn to your neighbor or a person close to you and start to have that dialogue, we'll give a couple minutes for that just to talk about how you all felt about the learnings. If you're joining virtually, you all can write in the chat what are some things. Okay, cool, Nina's got it. Thank you, Nina.
Do you want this one? Thank you. I don't mean to interrupt, but I just want to be able to be more curiouser and curiouser <laughs> of what's happening in the space. So I'd love if we have some brave folks for us to share questions, share thoughts, share um, inspirations with amongst each other. I feel like that's kind of what we do at Americans for the Arts, or at least in the research department. It's just kind of like pair with everybody to learn and to be mutually curious to make change. So I'd love to hear what you all came up with and some questions that you have. I want to give a sh quick shout out to Megan and Kristen who had wonderful questions that I was like, oh, remember, can you remember that question for me so that I can speak to it when we get back up here? And that, from that moment to here, I did forget it. So I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna remember, I just remembered to say remember the question, and then I learned both names, and then it got, it's gone now. So Megan, can you please share your question with me? Yes, we're gonna be mic passing, so thank you all for your patience as we pass the mic. And can we, oh, Selby's back, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jenna, I've really enjoyed the discussion. Um, my question, which I fortunately did remember, although I <laughs> just as easily would have forgotten it too, um, I was really excited by the successes that Selby and Eliza shared with um, creating new partnerships and new, relate, new trusting relationships and being able to do some work in communities where they hadn't done work before. But I was curious, how did you start that? Like what, what was your first step? to even be invited into those communities to begin offering the programming and, and creating those relationships. So I would just, I'm giving like three seconds of speech and then I'm gonna toss it to you all. Cause I'm not the people who are doing this. I'm doing the work to help do this, right? So I was gonna say that there are uh, resources that we have provided folks and it's almost like activation points we don't call them best practices. We don't call them like, here's a checkbox for you to do this list of things. We don't work in that way. We give them suggestions or activation points that you can perhaps do. Uh, for example, making phone calls, doing a bit of seeking knowledge of the community before even getting into the community. So that when you get there, it's not the community's responsibility to teach you about themselves. Um, it's their responsibility to make the connections in which you haven't received yet. So that's kind of like the resource-driven approach that Americans for the Arts helps provide to the other partners. But I'm sure, and I'm sure, not but, and I'm sure that Eliza and Selby have wonderful stories about how they have done that work as well. Who wants to start? Okay. Is this the girl microphone? Uh, Selby, I'm so sorry. I'm just butting in here. I'm, I'm right really ahead. excited by what you say. I don't think it's a case any longer of, you know, go forth the American way and create friends, make friends and influence people. For me, it's about beginning it now slowly creating the trust that lends itself to a neutral space where you find yourself, that you can take that notion a little further in terms of service to that community. So it, it's, it's not that kind of old fashioned notion of let's go out and win friends so that we can influence them. You know, it's really about creating a neutral space first and building the trust simultaneously bit by bit. There's a fabulous um, old uh, German philosopher called Goethe, and he, 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 one of his passages, I think it's possibly not Goethe, but it's always attributed to Goethe, and it's, it begins with those well-known words, begin it now. And then once you begin and you make that commitment, slowly things become, fall into place and become, make it easier for you to do that work. And, and often it is a case of falling forward, but just remember the forward rather than the fall. <laughs> it takes courage and I'm trying to live that and so are my marvelous team. Take it away. All right, um, and I would say yes and yes and yes to everything that they said, um, all, all agreeing. 
Um, you know, I, I think for us, it was a lot of um, asking questions. And so we've kind of put that into our mantra is to ask questions first, always, um, so that we better understand not just the work we're trying to do, but the communities that we serve. And so, you know, we, we as, as Jenna was saying, like we reached into um, the organization we already knew, the Hispanic Liaison, and, you know, we asked them questions about the, where we should be going and um, um, making sure we could make the right connections. But then we had to take it from there and we had to do our own research and understand um, how we could r represent the arts in a way that made sense to the communities we were going to. Um, and then the schools, the schools are just such a great conduit, um, at least into um, the populations where we live. And so asking them questions as to where are the folks who need our help the most? Um, and we found those resources to be of uh, great assistance to us as we started our path and finding ways to get these um, the arts into those communities and where people are. That's great. Thank you so much for that question. And I'm just going to round out that from Selby gave me an inspiration and then I remember talking to Megan and Kristen. And it's about understanding that even if you're in a rural space, not all rural looks like rural, or not all rural is the same, right? When we say rural, we don't all mean the same thing. It doesn't all look the same. Urban, not so much. You can kind of say like urban, okay, you're gonna know you're in a metropolitan space, right? But rural can look completely different. Um, and I think that that's the beauty of this conference and the beauty of it all, um, of, it, of this kind of work. So I just wanted to name that as I love Eliza's perspective and Selby's perspective, and both of them are completely different kind of rural spaces, and I just wanted to name that in the, in the space. More questions, more thoughts, more scorch moments. We have about five minutes or less. Yeah, Don. Is it just more about the way you categorize different ethnicities relative yeah. to the Americans of the Arts? So thank you. So Jenna, you said something earlier about the way you categorize the different groups and that you were not necessarily paying attention to the categories that were given to you, but you kind of um, evolved in some way your own? Well, I think w we didn't. We di it, it evolved on our, on our own in that the percentages changed. So we started with the 25% because we were thinking as a researcher would, um, not in equity-based practices, but in numbers, which is sometimes, this is my own personal opinion, sometimes the trouble with data is that quantitative space without having a story to support. So we were thinking about, okay, 25% means we get a good breakout amount to actually an an analyze. And then we went to the census data, albeit challenged, right? We, let's not talk about how, well, we can talk about, please let's talk about how the census is problematic yes. um, and rooted in some systemic challenges, uh, but it is data to data, right? So once we got to that level of understanding, okay, 25% is not gonna work for every community because that numbers don't make that make right. sense. Uh, that's when we went to the census to deliver the percentages based on that. So instead of 25%, perhaps, for example, in Eliza's community, she has about 15% of her populations identifies as um, white, non-Hispanic, and Latino, or Latinx. Um, and so that is where we landed with our percentages for the new requirement for the BIPOC and a lot of organizations. But you might say to me, and a lot of communities have said to me, Jenna, just because we have 15%, of people who identify as such does not mean we have 15% of our arts and culture organizations have, who identify as such. And to that I say yes. <laughs> to that I say uh, absolutely. But you know, there's um, also another point that you made, I think, when you talked about the white non-Hispanic, yeah. is that it ca it's a categorical problem because one, it's hard to explain, it's not clear, yeah. and it's really a kind of forced, um, it's a forced paradigm. Yeah. The Obama administration under the census had a real good um, had a real good recommendation that was not listened to by the next administration, mm -hmm. and that was to drop all the current categories and create a whole new set yeah. that are much more equitable and people are able to identify much more like they want to identify. Yeah. So I think you guys have looked into that a little bit and just saying we have to create a category that's going to work for people. Yep. 
So. That's, that's it, that is really it. When I said one of the key takeaways I hope that you get mm -hmm. is that um, process over perfection. We are not gonna be able to get it perfect because of challenges like you said, right? We're not gonna be able to get it right. We're gonna be able to get it better than AEP5 because we've been more intentional in our approach and we've centered this practice in equity. Um, but there, in a year to two years, we can't change all systems but we can move ourselves forward in a way. Um, so I definitely agree that we could have, I hope that, I wish that perhaps in the future we relook at those categories so that we don't have to just kind of uh, estimate where we are. Where a we're lot of people are putting themselves in categories they're not comfortable with and it's done for a certain yeah. reason and I just think there's a better way that's out there that hasn't been chosen yet. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Perfect. Thank you for that, the snaps, yes. Yes, any other thoughts, questions, scorcher moments? I'm okay with silence, so we can sit here for a second. I just don't want to lose anyone who wants to share voice. Sure. Oh, that's a great question. Um, Nina, you want me to repeat that question back so you don't have to chat? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So the question is, what about the resources? Are they ready to be shared? That's a great question. So. We have a number of different resources for this particular study. The first one is the Enga um, Engaging with Community Guide. Um, and that one is talking about, uh, to, Chris, no, to Megan's question about how do you start, that tells us how to start, and that goes through a process. And you can find that document actually on Americans for the Arts webpage um, under the AEP6 project. Page. I know there's a big, it's a big old website, y'all. I got a lot of stuff in there. So get to research. I know, Julie, you're looking. Get to research. And then once you get on the research page, you'll be able to find AEP6 a little bit easier. But it is on the website um, with the engaging with community. And then we have making connections with BIPOC and Alana organizations. And these resources were all birthed from the 395 community members. They said, like, yeah, Jenna, like, that's how you get started. But that means like you have to have a network first of BIPOC and a lot of people to get started to do this work. So that's why we made that second resource. And the third resource is coming. I wanna, I'm like, should I let the cat out of the bag for Radically Rural? Okay, Jessica said yes. So the third resource that we're building is going to be l slightly larger and it's going to be probably the most important one, which is going to be centered in maintaining and strengthening committed community relationships. So what does that look like? Okay, so we've, in, we've read, we read up on the community, we've engaged with them, we've made our connections with our BIPOC and Alana organization, but what happens if and when we continue? What happens if we, we love their organization, but we can't fund their organization because of you know, government funding, we, they don't have a 501c3, but they're doing great work. Or what happens if, you know, I don't have, um, I don't know what they need, um, or I can be, or what happens if, I insert all of the things. So that's the third document that's coming, and it's probably gonna be more like a workbook. So it'll give some suggestions and then have some activations based on our learnings in the field, um, and then also based on some research that supports those kinds of practices. So that's a great question, and eventually that will land on the uh, web page. We're hoping the first section of perhaps a six-part series will land on the web page in the fall this year. Great question. Zero moments of time left. I wanna do a quick thank you tour. Thank you to Jessica. Thank you to the interpreters who are killing it. And thank you to Nina and um, everyone who is in our space right here, our audience here. Thank you so much for showing up. And our audience online, thank you for so much for being active. And then both of our panelists, can you give it up one time for Eliza and Selby? Thank you. If you see a survey, take it. <laughs> thank you so much. I think our time is up. Bye.